Good morning to all. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome all the participants and further joining participants and learned speaker in the session, uh, my colleague Sri uh, G. Narendranath, Joint Secretary NSCS PK Singh, DDG SA DOT Headquarter, Group Captain uh, Dr. R.K. Singh from uh, NCIIPC, Sri Dhanesh Goel, D from DEC. As well as he said, NTIPRIT is regularly coming up with webinars on various contemporary topics like 5G, cyber security, IoT, blockchain, quantum computing, metaverse, and many more. In this series of webinar, today we are here today to discuss one of the most pressing issues facing our nation, telecom security. So the topic uh, we have named as telecom security ecosystem. I find perfect combination of speakers uh, which will make this webinar very effective. For that, uh, um, ESPR mm -hmm. unit okay. has made all our effort in uh, designing the topic and uh, uh, arranging speakers uh, to deliberate upon. So I congratulate the DGTS and PR, Sri Bhalla, directors and team of NTI Prit uh, for all the logistic uh, for arranging webinar on such important topic. Dear friends, with each passing day, security of telecom network is assuming higher significance. The challenges posed by convergence of telecom and information and communication technology all IP networks, hardware and software complexities, supply chain management, trust on data privacy and threats from state and non-state actors requires that government put in place a robust framework for ensuring end-to-end -end security, not just to... Audio is not there. Audio is there, sir. Please continue. It is there. It oh, is there, no, sir. Some, uh, some day wrote, uh, I think some one. specific user has problem, sir. So please continue, okay, okay. sir. So a government put in a place robust framework for ensuring end-to-end -end security, not just to protect interest of their citizen, but also the national security. As we all know, the telecom industry is the backbone of our digital infrastructure and plays a vital role in our uh, day-to-day uh, -day lives. It is critical that we safeguard this infrastructure and create a robust security ecosystem that protect our data, our privacy, and our national interest. Over the past few years, we have witnessed an exponential growth in the number of mobile users and internet subscribers in India. We remember those old days of PSTN uh, where uh, almost uh, the whole network was wired and uh, predominantly was on um, TDM based. Uh, but uh, as uh, GSM uh, peeped into the IP network came up, so it gives uh, voice and data both on IP network and mobility as well. So there has been exponential growth, but this growth uh, has come up with the security challenges that is inherent to the IP network. Cyber attacks, data breaches, and other security threats are becoming increasingly sophisticated, and we must be prepared to tackle them head on. As a government, we are committed to ensuring that the telecom security ecosystem in India is strong and resilient. Government and industries are taking several steps to achieve this goal. First and foremost, we are investing in state-of-the-art technology and infrastructure that can detect and prevent security threats in real time. Interestingly, all the threats have a, um, it has been observed that these threats have a given life cycle. So if we, if we observe these threats, it is uh, many times easy to mitigate them. The government is also working closely with telecom operator to ensure that they have the necessary tool and resources to protect their network from 
cyber attacks. But the government cannot do this alone. The board and cooperation of all the stakeholders, including telecom operators, technology companies, and individual users are needed. It is only by working together a truly secure telecom ecosystem in India, in our country, can be created. We are also in enhancing our regulatory framework to address emerging security threats, which is very, very important. We are we also regularly working on new guidelines that requires telecom operator to comply with strict security standards and undergo regular security audits. We are also working on strengthening our legal framework to ensure that those who engage in the cyber crime are dealt uh, clearly in the clear manner and brought to justice. With this, before I close, I urge all of you, all the participants, to take an active role in promoting uh, telecom security. As individual users, we must be vigilant about protecting our personal information and following best practices for online security. As industry leaders, we should prioritize security and invest in the necessary resources to safeguard our network and customers. With covering important topics in the, uh, in the session, uh, like uh, National Perspective on Telecom Security Ecosystem, TSOC, uh, TCSIRT, role of uh, NCI, IPC, and MTCT framework. I am sure we will have active discussion in the webinar. With this, I declare this webinar open and wish very beautiful discussion and success to it. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, now, uh, uh, with this, uh, just uh, so first uh, topic of uh, this webinar is uh, national perspective in telecom security ecosystem. So this topic will be taken by uh, uh, Sri G Narendra Nath sir. Uh, he is JS in uh, NSCS. Uh, CS. So uh, first of all, I will introduce to sir. So sir is working as G uh, hello. Any uh, you are audible. Yeah. Uh, some mic is on. Actually, I am getting echo, sir. You are getting an echo. Okay, we are getting it very clear. Okay, right, sir. So, sir is working as Joint Secretary, National Security Council Secretariat, with responsibility for coordinating and monitoring implementation in matter of cyber security R&D and activities by different entities in uh, of India in the government, public, and private sector and international bilateral and multilateral relations and in various international fora. Uh, prior to uh, this, uh, sir was a deputy director general in Department of Telecommunication Government of India with overall responsibilities for policy formulation and implementation and matter pertaining to uh, telecom network security of India. Uh, and he confirmed with uh, the award of uh, Sanchar Sironi by the Department of Telecommunication. Uh, sir has over 30 years of uh, the experience in the area of uh, network, secu uh, network security, law enforcement assistance, network planning, installation, operation, and maintenance, training, marketing of the uh, services, and business development. Uh, sir holds a uh, 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 master in uh, technology from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, with a specialization in uh, VLSI design. Uh, with this, now I request uh, Narendra, sir, to uh, give his uh, presentation. Over to you, sir. Sir, uh, your mic is off, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank sir, you, Mr. Uh, sir, uh, are you giving sir presentation or just you will speak, sir? Yeah, I'm going to speak here. Yeah. Right. Okay. Sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, morning, uh, all the participants here, uh, respected Mr. Rajiv Sinaji, Senior DDG of NTI Pratt, uh, Mr. Balla, and uh, the other uh, participants uh, in the webinar on the national perspective in telecom security. Yeah, uh, 
primarily I come from a telecom background and I've been in this area for quite some time now. One of the th first things that comes to mind is, you know, the International Telecommunication Union, Union Index on Cybersecurity, where, uh, you know, it's, it's been published also and uh, well uh, uh, circulated that India has jumped multiple places and reached uh, position number 10 in the Cybersecurity Index. Uh, which uh, the background work for uh, compiling the data for the cybersecurity index is done by the Department of Telecommunication, in, and they coordinate with various uh, departments and ministries, including with us, uh, the National Security Council Secretariat, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, uh, and, uh, and that is compiled and uh, is put out. And uh, for that, I think we should congratulate the DOT for having you know done a very good compilation of the state of the cybersecurity posture of the country. Uh, coming to the telecom sector per se, and from our office, you know, we look at multiple sectors and then we do some sort of a comparison about uh, how are each of the sectors. So vis-a-vis -vis other sectors, you will find that telecom sector along with the banking and financial sector has got a level of maturity, which is higher in terms of cybersecurity uh, uh, and the telecom and the, and the uh, sectoral security that is there compared to many other sectors. <laughs> being a technology driven uh, department and the financial and banking sector being, you know, uh, very critical in terms of the business continuity depends on having good uh, cybersecurity posture. You'll find that both of them have over a period of time developed both regulatory environments and technological environments, which ensures that, you know, they are secure. But and here we'll find that um, in the departments concerned, you know, like the Reserve Bank of India in, t in terms of the banking and financial sector and the Department of Telecommunication in, term, in case of the telecommunication sector, I've been proactive in working with the industry in, and trying to come up with what should be the security requirements that should be implemented in the sector. So in the telecom sector, we have the license uh, amendments through which uh, there are some stipulations on the uh, our service providers for not only providing quality of service, uh, for providing quality services and for rollout obligations, etc., but also has provisions for secure, securing the networks and also for the privacy and security of the data that is generated through the provision of those services. And uh, all of you, I mean, a bulk of you must be from the telecom sector in the uh, audience to, that we have today. But for those who are not or uh, who are not very familiar, you would find that uh, there, there's been evolution in the security requirements that are common this, uh, in the license conditions. And now there's a level of maturity even in those security requirements and a broad understanding both within with the regulator or the department and with the industry about what is required to be done. But having said that, is that uh, it's a work, is it a completed work? I would not say that. Because all, as you all know that the security landscape keeps on evolving. And even with the current state of the evolution of the landscape, you'll find that within the sector itself, that is the telecom sector itself, you'll find that there's a variation in the level of maturity in the service providers who provide services in the type of manpower that is deployed in them and the type of security solutions that they've deployed in their networks. Some of the bigger operators have got very robust systems in place. They've got very good teams in place and they provide good network security. But you would go down to uh, the bottom of the spectrum. Uh, you'll find that many of the other operators, the smaller operators, the service providers, would not be having a exclusive dedicated security teams in place. And they might not be having the required robustness in terms of the infrastructure that they've deployed for security. So that means that uh, there is still a lot of work to be done, both from the industry perspective and from uh, the department concern to ensure that the processes are uh, made more, uh, you know, more robust and uh, are in tune with the times. You know, with 5G and IoT uh, coming in a, in a broad way, the government had recognized that, uh, that, you know, the certain measures that are taken, they should be supplemented by some more measures that are required to be taken. 
that is where I will I will touch upon various aspects of this in the next ten minutes that I've got with me. In some uh, highlighting some of the issues that are there, and one of them is <coughs> the National Security Directive on the Telecommunication Sector that came out in December 2020. And that came out as a recognition of that, you know, the 5G is going to be largely deployed and that uh, and IoT also would be largely deployed and that the effect of this deployment would be cross sectoral and beyond reaching beyond the telecommunication sector. So it's required to uh, the punch minute. Just a minute. Punch minute. I'm talking about Sure. Okay. Huh? Uh, yeah, so recognizing that, you know, there's going to be a security implications beyond the telecommunication sector into all, all the other sectors and telecom sector being a super critical and all other services riding on that. It was looked at to see how do you secure it more, much more than what is currently happening. It was recognized, you know, while the exercise was going on that DOT has its own scheme of coming up with essential requirements for security and also coming up with you know, a certification and testing framework, testing and certification framework based on the products that are deployed or the services that are deployed in the telecom networks. And there's a license condition for that. But it was also uh, seen that we also have to ensure that the sources from where these products and or the services are delivered should also be secure. And that is where the NSTTS had come about. And from June of, 20, June of 2021, we have a license amendment which now says that only trusted products from trusted sources can be deployed in the networks. So that, that is one very important part where we look at the companies uh, who product the, provide the products and then evaluate them based on their ownership or from where they are operating and their previous history and other, other such parameters to recognize if they are trusted and then we declare them as trusted. And based on that trust, then the service providers can, uh, you know, put these products in the networks. Beyond that, the products are also evaluated. See if from a trusted source are the products also trusted and where we explore the product into the components which are there and we look at the programmable components and see where do these components come from and are they also from trusted sources and then declare a product if the components also come from trusted sources. Oh, yeah. Both hardware and software components. Hmm? Okay. Hmm. Both hardware and software uh, components which are there, uh, they are evaluated for uh, whether they're coming from trusted sources and based on that the product is trust treated as a trusted product. Currently, the focus is on uh, looking at the products and the sources of those products. But going down the line, we would also look at a uh, little more granularity into the components where uh, a little more, uh, we would be actually looking at that also. And we are releasing a version two of the portal where, uh, you know, the people put in the details about the products and the sources and the evaluation happens, where we are also going to capture the information regarding system integrators. But because we understand now, like for example, the BSNL tender that has come about where Tata's have come up as one, one both as an OEM and a system integrator. So there would be some system integrators who might not be OEMs, but then who would be providing services of system integration. So we'd be evaluating even system integrators to see if they are trusted sources. Managed service providers are also to see that they were, if they are trusted sources. So that is another thing that would be coming up uh, starting next month, and where we'll be evaluating them also. Uh, this is a the work that's been happening and we actually industry, you know, for the amount of cooperation that's come about for them to recognize that this is something that's required to be done for the country and also for them to you know work with us to see how do we smoothly uh, come up, come up with processes to enable this to happen one another aspect that you know uh, troubles especially for the telecom sector is that limited set of vendors that we have you know because of the consolidation that has happened over a period of time we find that there's uh, limited vendor diversity in many of the product lines that are there so that is one area that uh, that is of uh, if you look at the national perspective on the telecom sector uh, security uh, that is one area that is required so in this area one initiative has access network initiative where uh, you know there are uh, and this is an initiative that has come from the operator side 
to increase the vendor diversity, especially in the radio access network area. Here uh, we have the open run, uh, open run airlines, which the where these standards are coming about. And there's a body of work that's happening here. There are some companies that are there, and there's a good opportunity for Indian companies also to get in the space. And then start uh, providing uh, radio access network products in this area. So this is one area where uh, we're working along with the industry and Department of Telecom has been very active in this area. And this is an initiative that has also been happening in the quad, in the uh, quad critical emerging technologies area. This is one line of item on which we are working to work with the quad partners to see how do we uh, proliferate and encourage open radio access networks. There are some issues here, uh, especially because the uh, technology is still evolving. Uh, that, but they require to be addressed, and they are not. It's not that there are some insurmountable issues, but it is required that we understand that there are issues, and these issues have to be uh, addressed, especially uh, regarding uh, you know interoperability uh, uh, is very important component, and the requirement of having system integrators also coming to this because there are multiple vendors who will be coming in with different pieces of the open air architecture. The, the other aspect is, you know, when you're looking at security of networks is uh, how do you uh, do some predictive analysis of uh, the network, network traffic and then, you know, protect your infrastructure. Uh, so some of the proactive measures that, should, that could be taken in uh, the telecommunication networks are risk analysis and risk mitigation measures. A formal process should be there in both at the level of the department for the sector sector and at the level of the entities, you know, independent entities, the service providers to do a risk analysis to find out what are the possible risks, both in terms of the network deployed and in terms of service provisioning that happens. And then from that basic risk analysis that happens, then come about what are the mitigative measures that should be taken and what is that risk that cannot be mitigated and that could be accepted, but that should be there should be a recognition that yes, this is some risk that we are accepting, and that should be a conscious decision that should be taken. That uh, one aspect is uh, what we understand is an area that requires further improvement in this sector for uh, actually providing a robust security framework. The other uh, uh, aspect is regarding audits. We have a formal security audit mechanism that's been created. But I think uh, in the security audit mechanism, uh, there should be a little more of granularity about you know, what you're looking at. And, uh, and there's a little more of uh, technological insight into what you're looking at that is required to be brought. I think maybe it's a review of the security audit that's been happening because it's been happening for now around uh, four or five years now. And, uh, that is one area because the proactive measures, if you talk in terms of security, in addition to the risk analysis I talked about, security audit is an important component of that. We are happy that uh, for the NSDTS, the security directive compliance regarding trusted products being used in the networks, uh, the OT has come up with the that they've incorporated the audit mechanism into the existing inspection performance that they already have. And uh, shortly, they would be starting off some inspections to find out if the compliance from the service provider is happening for the implementation of the uh, trusted uh, source directive. We also have, you know, the minimum baseline security standards that have been uh, given out by DOT. And that is another area, I think, uh, that should be checked up in during the security audit see, to see if that the minimum baseline security standards have been incorporated or not. And when the first draft or first cut of the MBSS has been made uh, around uh, four, four or five years back, uh, that was done at that, because it was the initial one, it was done at that based on the understanding we had at that time. I think this also might require uh, some amount of tweaking to understand what further is required to be added into this. The other aspect uh, uh, that is of importance is hardware security and device device level security. In the hardware security part, there's not much of work that's happened. Uh, from our side, what we've done is sets Chennai. That's uh, an institution sets in Chennai, where we have uh, you know identified that as an agency where we would like to build competence in uh, hardware security. And we have funded a project from our office to establish a center 
there for hardware security. And we've also involved uh, you know, persons from DOT to be part of the review committee of the project so that the requirements of DOT also are embedded into the setup that is coming up in SETS Chennai. Uh, device security is uh, one part that, uh, though it's been recognized, is not something that we have really looked at. But I think we'll have to evolve standards and testing and certification procedures for that because device, uh, all in all, it connects into the network and is a bearing on the complete telecom uh, security. The, uh, the, the other is, uh, you know, the, the regarding the network traffic uh, part of it is to have a security operating center. Many of the bigger companies have security operating centers, but I think the smaller entities don't have a security operating center. How do we see to it that, is it possible to have a smaller version of a security operating center? Or is it possible to have a community security operating center where multiple operators can you know, plug into that cloud-based security operating center that could be happening? And that is something that I think could be explored. Uh, it's, TSOC is a very good uh, example of you know, what's the initiative that's been taken uh, in, in this regard. Uh, the other is uh, regarding, uh, you say, proactive measures is for the deployment of honeypots into telecom networks. There's a project that we have given to CDAC Mohali for development of uh, intelligent honeypots. There, I think, uh, we have also told them that one of the sectors in which the honeypots deployment should happen is in the telecom sector. I think they could work, we could work closely to see that honeypot deployments happen in uh, the telecom sector also. For us to have a visibility into the type of uh, malware that is floating around and the type of infrastructure that is getting targeted. So this would be very uh, imp in useful information that would help in, uh, you know, in terms of uh, feeding into the security operating center, the TSOC, and helping in, uh, you know, configuring your firewalls and other security apparatus that is uh, in embedded into the networks. Uh, one other aspect uh, that I would like to bring to your notice is regarding the phone frauds that are happening, you know, and that's peculiar to the telecom sector. Um, especially regarding the SIMs, you'll find that uh, newspaper reports coming about multiple thousands of SIMs being found with one individual or not. We, at a particular point of time in the evolution of telecom sector, it was very important that we have an expansion and penetration were, were very two important concepts that we were working on. And we require to have very simple processes and, you know, and a reach for people to get SIM cards at all the locations so that people could be onboarded into the telecom networks and they could start availing telecom services. But now with the type of uh, events that are happening and the KYC issues that are popping up and the frauds that are being committed based on those KYC issues that are coming up, I think there is a requirement to relook into the type of uh, the, how do we actually give SIMs to people? How do we do the KYC to see that this area of uh, the uh, telecom security is tightened? Final, I would like to talk about uh, capacity building. You know, one thing about the telecom security is one aspect that is required to be looked at whether we have the sufficient capacity in terms of the people who can man and then understand the security issues that are there in telecom networks and uh, you know work towards making them uh, more secure. So here we look at, are there adequate uh, academic programs available like MTech programs or PhDs uh, happening so that we get adequate manpower that can feed into the industry, especially you know with skill sets that are required for addressing issues of the telecom network security. The other is of course the training program across the industry and within the Department of Telecommunication also. So from here, uh, there is one national cyber exercise that we did last year, and we're going to do it this year also, uh, where uh, people from the telecom sector also participated. And it's a good exercise for with red teaming and blue teaming and for uh, getting insights into how do you do incident management and how do you recognize incidents. And there, there is also a project that we are doing for a national cyber range uh, with, in, with the National Rashi Raksa University. Uh, funded from this office and uh, we are also involving uh, DOT uh, along with the cyber range because we want that the cyber range should have use cases specific to uh, the telecom sector also embedded into that cyber range. Hopefully we'll have active participation of DOT and they will give good insights for design good and proper uh, national cyber range which incorporates the requirements of the telecommunication sector also in that.
So uh, with these uh, words, I think I've completed uh, the allotted time. I just wanted to bring about, uh, there is another point, of course, uh, finally, I would like to say is, you know, emerging technologies which are there and some of the emerging technologies we talk about is quantum is another area. And in telecom, we have lots of encryption that happens over the encryption and encryption within networks. And so QKD is one area. Good to hear that CDOT does, is doing a lot of work in the QKD area and also in the area of post-quantum uh, cryptography. And this is one area I think the, this active involvement should happen right from now onwards to understand this technology so that we are ready for you know, embedding the technology into our existing telecommunication networks. The other area, of course, is the artificial intelligence area. Especially in the security area, the number of incidents that get generated, the number of alerts that get generated is humongous. It's not humanly possible to look at all of them unless you have an automation that happens. And artificial intelligence tools are one of the main mechanisms for you know looking at all of those alerts and then having a proper response and remediation mechanism. So a good understanding of that is also required. Of course, artificial intelligence is also required for optimization purposes for network operations. That is another area. But for talking from the security perspective, a good understanding of artificial intelligence is also required in this area. So with these words, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to talk to you. Uh, thanks, sir, for a wonderful uh, presentation. So now I request to uh, Vishal Dheer to give a vote of thanks to sir. Uh, just a second, this one. Um, yes, sir, sir, please. Um, Narin, few words more on cyber range and some honey bag you inserted in the project given to uh, SIDAC Mune. I'm not aware of that. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, okay. Few more words yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah, take it, take it. The honeypot, honeypot means, you know, what happens is you create an environment which is similar to what existing environment. So if any person who's attacking would land on the honeypot and then he will think it's a actual infrastructure and then he will do all the malicious activity there. So when that malicious activity had happened, you capture all that malicious code, uh, all of that. And then you get an idea of, you know, the type of infrastructure that people are targeting and what is the type of malicious activity that's happening. Yeah. Based on that, then you can take, uh, you know, then by looking at it, then you can tell all the operators saying, you know, this is the type of malicious activity in the network and kindly take these remediation measures. That is good. Okay. That is the honeypot thing. So, but the honeypot has to be designed peculiar to the sector. I mean, a power sector honeypot is, will be different from a telecom sector honeypot, will be different from a, uh, okay. you know, banking sector honeypot. So we have told them to design honeypots for the telecom sector also, so that they can be deployed in the telecom sector. So that Mohali has good infrastructure? Yeah, 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 yeah. They have developed a very good uh, expertise in this area. So uh, that is one area. So we, we like, you know, that uh, DOT really coordinates with them to uh, get those honeypots and then get them deployed. That is one. Uh, the cyber range is one, it's a range for, uh, practical hands-on training for people. Okay. So the train, like for example, if you create a power sector sort of an environment of OT and IT in that, so the person will be able to see attacks happening on SCADA systems, for example. How do I remediate? How will an attack? So you'll be simulating, simulating all of those environments there. Similarly, if you simulate an environment of the telecom sector and the cyber range. I mean, one of the things we're looking at, you know, for having a cyber range hosted at uh, NT Airport earlier. Yeah. <laughs> you were yeah, very keen. But now we have funded a project in the Russia, Russia University. So, and we have also uh, asked, you know, NTIP to be part of that uh, project review committee so that you can give requirements of uh, your requirements. So when you design it, those requirements are taken care of. That was, that's important, actually. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Vishal, please. Thank you. Mm. Vishal, your mic is off. Uh, sorry, uh, Mike was off. Good morning, sir. This is uh, Vishal, the director of PR at NKIPRIT. First of all, I'd like to thank you for taking out time from your busy schedule for this webinar and setting the tone of this webinar by sharing your insights on national perspective related to telecom security. It was quite an insightful session and I hope uh, people must have uh, gained a lot uh, because most of people are not aware what, what are the new fronts going on in this perspective and you shared a quite uh, deliberated uh, session on that. Uh, thanks a lot, sir, from India. Over to you, Yashan, sir. Thank you, Vishal, and uh, thank you, sir, 
uh, for your presentation. Now, uh, yeah, next session, next session is about uh, T sock and T shirt. Uh, so uh, this session will be uh, taken by uh, Sri uh, P K Singh sir. He is uh, DDG SA in DOT headquarter. So first, uh, first of all, I will introduce to sir. So P K Singh sir is uh, DDG Security Assurance in DOT headquarter, and sir is also acting as a Chief Information Security Officer of Department of Telecommunication. He has very good experience in telecom security. Uh, he has also excellent experience in digital financial transaction security while working at uh, Telecom Engineering Center. Sir has vast experience in laying down the technical specification for various telecom uh, products, network elements, testing, and uh, evaluating them against the laid down specification and international standard. Uh, with this, now I request to uh, PK Singh, sir, to uh, start his uh, presentation. Over to you, sir. <laughs> Uh, thank you and uh, great to be back uh, once again with NTI TRIT in a very uh, 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 excellent and uh, uh, required uh, session on uh, discussing the ecosystem of uh, telecom security uh, within the country. So in this uh, series, uh, uh, I would be discussing something about uh, the telecom security operation center and uh, the telecom uh, computer system uh, uh, incidents response team, uh, both the security operation center and the CSIRT, they are uh, related. The PPT is visible to all. Yes, sir. Yeah, it is. Visible. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, coming to the uh, complexity of uh, Indian Telecom Network, we have uh, uh, more than uh, 117 uh, uh, crore mobile users, uh, 81.62 broadband users. Then the, we have uh, more than 50 crores uh, OTT and social media users. And uh, the data usage uh, per quarter has been uh, estimated to be 34608 petabytes, so which is uh, very, very huge. And in fact, uh, is considered that this uh, 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 quarterly usage is is going to increase in leaps and bounds. So basically, what we are uh, uh, viewing is that uh, the telecom usage in the country is uh, uh, shifting from voice only to to data. Uh, uh, prominence of data is there, and once the data is there, it prom it uh, means that end to end the data connectivity is established. And uh, when we say end-to-end -end data connectivity is established, it uh, means that uh, the end user terminal becomes part of the global internet and it is accessing all others and all others are also able to access it. And uh, this uh, data connectivity, all connectivity uh, uh, could be uh, uh, misused by malicious actors and hence we need to have certain mechanisms uh, which will allow us to do a monitoring of the telecom network and take appropriate action in case some malicious activity or some illegal usage etc is detected and uh, it is towards this particular aspect that uh, the security operation centers have been uh, uh, designed and uh, since the security operation center, we are going to deploy for monitoring the telecom network and telecom uh, network users. So we have given the name as telecom security operation center, abbreviated as TSOC. Uh, we have uh, uh, quite a lot of references uh, wherein uh, certain uh, breaches have happened, certain personal identifiable information has been uh, breached onto the net uh, onto the dark web, then uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, financial frauds are happening. Then uh, a lot of uh, 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 data is getting leaked into uh, the the uh, normal internet and the dark internet. Then there have been a lot of uh, ransomware attacks also uh, in in the country. So a need is there to have certain mechanism which can provide us 
a certain information which will help us in in uh, proactively detecting the uh, imminent attack or uh, imminent uh, 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 cyber security breach which is about to happen and uh, if it is available for the telecom sector it is very good why because the telecom sector is is the is the backbone over which uh, the other uh, uh, critical sectors and other critical uh, part of the government uh, are are operating uh, for their day to day operations for business for uh, economic transactions for commercial transactions a lot of things happen uh, over the telecom uh, network hence uh, keeping the telecom network free from all these things and having certain mechanisms in the form of tsoc which will assist in proactively detecting the malicious elements and the malicious actions will go a long way in in keeping the entire economy entire uh, uh, operations of the government intact and that is why the tsoc uh, has been uh, conceptualized and deployed the uh, tsoc was uh, basically the need was felt uh, a long time back uh, almost 2015 uh, uh, 14 uh, uh, narendra sir uh, 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 is there so he would also vouch for this fact that uh, when he was uh, dg security in dot it was that time when the need of uh, a security operation center for telecom network was felt and uh, the mandate uh, was taken from uh, the uh, ndcp uh, 2018 document and it is this mandate which was uh, 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 given in the in the uh, ndcp uh, document in 2018 uh, which basically uh, allowed us to move ahead and uh, cdot by that time had already been given the the work of uh, uh, doing a prototype development and they had started this activity in uh, 2017 and in uh, uh, 2021 uh, we basically uh, constituted the uh, interministerial committee and uh, got it uh, uh, tested and verified and uh, after that uh, there has been no looking back and currently we have covered uh, uh, around uh, 110 gateways only uh, 10 or 12 gateways are pending where we are uh, to deploy the ip fix probe as part of the uh, tsoc uh, uh, information collection uh, we will shortly see what exactly is the architecture of uh, the tsoc but uh, the tsoc development has been a journey uh, and uh, we are still continuing uh, because we are not going to end just by deployment we are basically going to add a new user cases a newer and newer use use cases because uh, uh, as i said that security is basically not uh, 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 one incident it is basically a journey on which we have to keep on walking 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 and there is no end to it so today uh, uh, there are x amount of uh, vulnerabilities which are being exploited tomorrow uh, there will be a delta x uh, added on to those vulnerabilities so we basically have to uh, keep on uh, developing new uh, use cases new algorithms new uh, uh, signature based detections etc as part of our uh, journey over tsoc uh, so basically uh, the threat detection techniques which is uh, made use uh, in the tsoc uh, can be uh, broadly categorized uh, into two types the first is the signature based wherein we are aware of uh, the uh, known uh, vulnerabilities or known uh, malicious actors and all these known malicious actors uh, let's say like uh, the viruses trojans malwares uh, so they basically are known to us and uh, we can identify them by their known signatures so in tsoc we would basically be doing a analysis and doing a pattern recognition or pattern match on the basis of these signatures and then we would be identifying that this particular packet is carrying such and such type of uh, malicious traffic the second one is a uh, behavior based uh, in the behavior based uh, what we do is basically uh, the protocol uh, the tcp ip stack complete stack uh, 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 comprising of many 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 protocols 
uh, they basically have to act in a certain manner. And if that normal action uh, happening uh, in a unknown method, then it is flagged and it is considered as suspicious. Then there are uh, other uh, methods also uh, which uh, uh, enable us to identify whether this uh, suspicious traffic is a malicious attempt or not. So uh, all those techniques are integrated uh, into the TSOC uh, algorithms and on the basis of uh, those uh, uh, algorithms, uh, we are basically able to uh, identify whether a particular traffic is a malicious traffic or a, a, a normal traffic. And as Narina ji has said that there is a really a need of uh, 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 making use of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to do uh, uh, analysis of the traffic since the traffic is, is so huge that it cannot be handled in a manual manner. So we have accordingly made use of uh, the artificial intelligence and machine learning in uh, uh, developing the capabilities of TSOC. Uh, we'll shortly see uh, the architecture. So that when we want to know about the capabilities of TSOC, the TSOC is able to identify a compromise system and it is also able to identify uh, which command and control uh, server or which command and control system is attacking the various uh, uh, endpoints uh, in the telecom network of the country. Then uh, it also helps in detection of uh, various attacks like uh, the denial of service attack or distributed denial of service attacks, uh, DNS amplification attacks, then uh, malicious domain communications, etc. So it is able to identify that. It is also able to uh, 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 identify uh, if a packet is is being uh, sent over a public network with uh, non-routable IP addresses. So it is able to detect that also. Ideally, the uh, over the public network, no packet with uh, non-routable destination IP address should be there. But uh, we have observed uh, uh, in our telecom networks that uh, certain packets are are emanating, and when we Going to the root cause analysis, we find that uh, there have been certain uh, uh, configurations in the uh, gateway routers of uh, a few of the telecom service providers and few of the ISPs. Uh, we are able to identify uh, who are making use of uh, the dark web, uh, who are making use of uh, VPNs, and who are making use of uh, the encrypted tunnels, etc. Uh, those type of uh, uh, activities are also possible to be detected. Uh, then uh, uh, we are able to monitor at the global level and at the country level also. Then uh, the we can do a detection of uh, the blocked apps, whether these blocked apps, URLs, IPs have really been uh, effectively blocked or not in the uh, telecom network of uh, the uh, country under the instructions of the government of India. So we are able to identify whether the uh, blocking efficacy is, is good or or not good or bad or not at all there, then we can uh, identify the uh, communications from uh, SIP servers and uh, SIP gateways. And uh, since uh, the system has been developed by CDOT, so whatever uh, new requirements are there uh, from the user agencies, those new requirements also can be uh, met by developing the uh, uh, algorithms, new algorithms, or modifying the existing algorithms to take care of uh, the new developments. As I had said that uh, security is, is a journey and you have to keep on walking and you have to keep on covering the distance. So this particular feature uh, wherein we can uh, go for new algorithm developments or modification of the existing algorithm, uh, that is part of our journey which we'll be continuing. Coming to the TSOC architecture, uh, it basically comprises of uh, the uh, from the the telecom network where the actual traffic is is uh, uh, flowing, where the actual communication is flowing. So uh, in the telecom network, we are deploying the flow generators. Flow generators are basically the IP fix probes. So they will basically generate uh, the flow information. A flow is uh, defined as a, a, a combination of packets having similar characteristics. So similar characteristics could be the source IP address, the destination IP address, source port, the destination port, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is basically what uh, exactly is a flow, and that flow is basically given to a collector. Uh, 
uh, which is uh, uh, located uh, centrally and uh, uh, once the flow has been collected at a central location then there is a big data analyzer platform it basically makes use of uh, the artificial intelligence and machine learning all the algorithms which uh, we have talked of the behavior based and the signature based and any new algorithm uh, is made use uh, uh, through the uh, uh, ai uh, platform and once uh, that has been done then it is basically a presentation visualization presentation and reporting to the end users so this is basically the broad uh, architecture and uh, what we have done is in developing this architecture, we have made use of certain existing uh, uh, equipments which have already been deployed in the telecom service providers network. So this uh, this part, the ISP gateway, then uh, the optical passive uh, probes or taps and uh, the uh, internet uh, gateway routers, etc. Uh, these things are basically uh, uh, existing already. The traffic aggregator, the session based load balancer, the internet monitoring system, these things are existing already. And what we have done is from the traffic aggregator and the session, uh, the load balancer, we are taking a copy of the traffic and giving to the IP fix flow generator. And the IP fix flow generator generates the flow and sends it over the MPLS network to a central uh, location. And there we do the necessary uh, 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 gathering of uh, intelligence, taking out the intelligence, uh, out of uh, the flows which have been received at the central location. And uh, uh, what we are doing is we are also providing a copy of the flow information to NCCC, the National Cyber Coordination Center, under uh, 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 a part of uh, the CERT N. So they are also uh, developing the capabilities of uh, collecting the flow information from all the 120 gateways. Currently, they have uh, the capability of collecting the information from 30 such uh, uh, gateways. So they have been given the mandate to collect the traffic uh, from all the 120 gateways. And once they start uh, collecting it and uh, analyzing it, uh, the security posture of uh, a country would certainly uh, increase. Uh, so coming to, to the TSOC architecture, uh, we have already seen it comprises of uh, probe IPFX collectors and then uh, the uh, Kafka server is basically used to streamline the traffic collected and forward it to the Spark servers where the actual uh, 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 intelligence gathering and intelligence uh, culling happens. Then uh, we have the uh, 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 storage uh, uh, servers. We do a storage for uh, uh, a seven day uh, period, not uh, uh, more because uh, we didn't uh, 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 plan for uh, uh, heavy storage, but uh, one year storage has been implemented is is in the mandate of uh, NCCC. And then we have uh, basically the various uh, uh, visualization, reporting and uh, uh, display uh, systems as part of the TSOC architecture. Uh, this is some statistical information about uh, uh, the uh, performance of uh, the TSOC, uh, what uh, uh, malicious traffics uh, we have detected during the past uh, 23 months. Uh, and uh, what we are doing is basically whatever uh, we are detecting, we are sharing with all the telecom service providers and uh, and uh, earlier we used to share with uh, individual uh, uh, offices also, but now we are sending it to uh, a, a, a CERT, NCII, PC, MHA and uh, uh, NSCS so that uh, they can take the appropriate action and we are concentrating on uh, the telecom, uh, 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 the IP addresses, uh, uh, which is uh, within the domain of uh, the telecom service providers. Now we have basically been able to establish the TSOC and uh, it is uh, uh, running and uh, we are in the process of uh, extending the uh, connectivity of the TSOC to various uh, agencies so that they also can get uh, the report uh, first hand. Uh, rather than uh, receiving the reports uh, 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 through the MHA mechanism. So uh, we are in the process of extending the terminals of the TSOC to uh, NCII, PC, uh, NIC, uh, uh, IB, then 
uh, our defense uh, security uh, agency also. So we are in the process of uh, developing the TSOC to become a, 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 a system which is made use by all the uh, agencies which are involved in the cyber security uh, within the country. Now, these are some of the malwares which have been uh, detected as part of uh, the monitoring done by the TSOC. Now, coming to the uh, telecom computers uh, uh, security incidents uh, response team, uh, we have deployed TSOC, but uh, 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 with the objective of uh, doing a proactive monitoring. But despite all this, it is possible that uh, some incident might happen. When I say incident, there might be uh, some uh, unauthorized uh, intrusion uh, into uh, any computer system. And uh, through that unauthorized uh, uh, intrusions uh, in a computer system, it is quite possible that certain uh, uh, information might have been uh, accessed and might have been uh, uh, offloaded. So in such cases, basically, we basically say that uh, a security incidents has happened. Now to take care of uh, uh, these security incidences in order to do an uh, investigation and uh, determine how the incidents has happened from where the uh, intrusion has happened, etc. We basically require a, a computer security incidents response team. And since this computer security incidents response team uh, has to have the mandate over the telecom network, so we have uh, defined it as a telecom a C cert. Now this telecom C cert uh, is basically going to do the incident handling and the incident handling. <coughs> uh, comprises of various uh, activities. The first part is the investigation uh, analysis. Then the second part is uh, uh, taking the mitigation uh, action. Then third is uh, eradicating it, then uh, doing a recovery and uh, the post incident activities in the form of uh, generating uh, uh, various advisories, uh, various uh, security notes, etc., uh, uh, are required to be disseminated to uh, all the stakeholders so that uh, we are able to take care of uh, uh, these type of uh, incidences in near future. And this basically goes on and on. So this is how the uh, incidents is required to be handled. Now coming to the framework. Uh, a telecom C cert is basically. Uh, uh, sir, uh, time is already completed. So can you uh, 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 finish quickly, sir? Ah uh, yes, this is basically the the uh, security uh, telecom C cert framework, wherein we have the various agencies which are stakeholders. So what we find is that uh, all the uh, cyber security agencies are uh, uh, stakeholders in this, and uh, the. Uh, functionalities which the telecom C cert is going to perform uh, could be comprised, uh, could be categorized into two functions, the core functions and the proactive and additional functions. Core functions are basically the incident uh, reporting and incidents response. So all the telecom service providers, uh, they would be, uh, they are being asked to report any security incident in their network uh, to the TC cert. And uh, in case of any incident happening, then uh, the TC cert team is doing uh, incidents uh, response by way of uh, uh, analyzing, uh, uh, mitigating, and uh, generating the reports. Then uh, there are proactive and additional functions, uh, which basically uh, comprise of uh, information provision, providing security tools to its constituents, issuing alerts, advisories, then doing a, keeping a technology watch, et cetera, et cetera. So these are various functions which uh, the TC cert is going to uh, perform and is, is performing, but uh, since uh, uh, it has been uh, uh, established recently, so there are certain teething troubles and uh, there are certain uh, operational issues which are basically going to be taken care of uh, in 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 a uh, short uh, uh, near future. Now uh, we basically have uh, the TC cert at uh, as a hierarchical uh, uh, structure. There is uh, the telecom C cert at DOT headquarter, which will look into the policy uh, matters. Then there is a uh, operational uh, a TC cert at a DGT headquarter, which will be the overarching uh, 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 role playing body at uh, within the telecom uh, uh, sector. And then there would be field uh, uh, positions of uh, the TC cert at uh, the individual LSAs. 
uh, which would be taking care of uh, the actual uh, work which has to be done by telecom csert uh, with this i complete my uh, 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 presentation in fact yes i would like to mention that uh, uh, information sharing and response portal uh, uh, is being developed which will uh, facilitate uh, the sharing of uh, uh, information among the various uh, stakeholders as part of the tsoc and tccert activities thank you Thank you very much, sir, for uh, your nice presentation. Now I request to Vishal Deer for give vote of thanks to uh, BK Singh, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, respected BK Singh, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking out time from a busy schedule for sharing your insights on TSOC project in this uh, particular webinar. Uh, your insights were quite uh, uh, helpful to the audience, I hope, and uh, you gave a quite perspective that what DOT is doing in this regard and how we are moving forward while tackling the telecom security in this domain. Thanks once again, sir. Over to you, Tishwin, sir. Thank you, Vishal. Now, uh, next topic is about role of uh, NCIIPC. So, this session will be taken by uh, Mr. Uh, Group Captain R.K. Singh. Uh, he's director in NCIIPC. So just uh, first, I will introduce to Sri R.K. Singh. Uh, 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 group captain R.K. Singh is working as director at uh, National uh, Critical Infrastructure uh, uh, in Information Infrastructure Production Center. He is responsible for banking, uh, uh, financial sector, uh, and uh, insurance and telecom uh, dealing with uh, identifying the uh, identification of CIA and production of critical uh, sector entities in the, uh, these two uh, sectors. He has uh, more than 26 years of vast experience uh, as installation maintenance engineer for various type of uh, radars and communication system of Air Force, including networking and uh, cyber security. Uh, with this, now I welcome to uh, Sri uh, uh, R.K. Singh. Uh, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, Son Saaf, for my introduction. Uh, I hope I am audible to you. Please confirm. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead, go ahead. And uh, are you able to see my PPT slide? Yes, 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 please. Okay, so uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, NTIPRIT for giving me opportunity to interact with various stakeholders of uh, telecom sector, which is one of the most critical sector of country. Uh, coming about 15 to 20 minutes, I am going to cover the roles and responsibility of NCIIPC, that is basically National Critical Information Infrastructure Protection Center. So, if you consider total Indian cyber space, so we are having yeah, I very received a call. Yeah. I don't know what called. Uh, please confirm uh, my next slide is visible to you about uh, CII, Indian Cyberspace. Yes, one sir, please uh, confirm my slide is visible to you. Uh, yeah, uh, since sir, your slide is visible please, and voice is also clear. Please go ahead. Okay. So, Indian Cyberspace, uh, within Indian Cyberspace, we are having total seven critical sectors, which I will discuss later. And out of these critical sectors, we are having CII. CI is basically critical information infrastructure. So these are the crown jewels which various critical sectors are having. For example, in present case, telecom sector is one of the critical sector and within telecom sector, there are various critical sector entities. For example, BSNL, MTNL and other licensed telecom service providers. So with each telecom service provider, there will be some computer resource which will be critical. We define CII as per IT Act 2000. That CII means any computer resource, the incapacitation or destruction of which shall have debilitating impact. Now, any cyber attack of any computer resource will certainly going to have some impact. But as far as CII is concerned, the impact has to be felt at national level and that too with four pillars. That is, first of all, national security, Next is national economy, followed by public health and public safety. It is not necessary that any cyber attack or incapacitation is having impact on any four. However, any having any impact on any one of these also 
lead to be notification as a CI for protected system. And as per IT Act, appropriate government may notify the CII and its associated dependency as protected system. And in case some IT resources has been notified as a protected system, then benefit is that any person who secures the unauthorized access to notified protected system is liable for imprisonment up to 10 years. That is as per IT Act Section 70. Third para. However, as per section 66F, that is cyber terrorism, in case unauthorized access has been observed, which leads to cyber terrorism, then this punishment can be extended to life imprisonment. NCIPC has been considered as per section 70 of IT Act which says that the appropriate government may, by notification in the official gadget, declare any computer resource which directly or indirectly affects the facility of critical information infrastructure to be protected system. The second sub para says that appropriate government may, by order in writing, authorize the person who are authorized to access the protected system. Because as earlier I have discussed, if someone is not authorized, and if he has access to protected system, then he is liable to be punished. So first of all, we need to notify or authorize someone in writing that who is the authorized person who can access the protected system. Any person who secures access or attempt to secure access to protected system who is not supposed to do that, then he can have imprisonment that can be extended till 10 years or liable to find or in case that falls under para 66F, then life imprisonment. And central government self prescribed the information security practices and procedures for protected systems. So basically, once we notify something as a protected system, then as a critical sector entity, once your ICT resources has been notified as protected system, then you are supposed to follow some standard practices, which has been again gadget notified as per IT rules 2018, which I will discuss later. Now there are two sections in section 70. Section 70A that is specific to NCIPC and section 70B that is specific to certain. As per section 70A, the central government may by notification publish in office gadget, designate any organization of the government as the national Federal agency in respect of CI protection. So NCIPC comes into existence by gadget notification of 16 John January 2014 as per section 78. So we are the national nodal agency for the protection of CII. And this gadget notification is called Information Technology Rules 2013. And other gadget notification is 2018 as per which all notified agencies are supposed to follow the best security practices that is called information technology rules 2018. So this is the gadget notification as per which NCIPC come into existence. And this is the gadget notification for uh, 2018 rules. Now coming to critical sectors, as on date, we are having total seven critical sectors. The first one is banking, financial services and insurance. This includes various banking, whether it is private or uh, whether it is a government or a PSU bank or a public or private. So all banking services are market exchanges that comes uh, regulated under SEBI. All insurance agency, including PFRDA, these all are part of BFSI. This also includes CBDT and CBIC. Other critical sector is the telecom sector, which already earlier speaker has stressed the importance of this critical sector. We call telecom and other sectors power sector. This both sectors we call as a mother sector because in case of any cyber attack or incapacitation, other critical sectors 
may not be able to function properly next one is power and energy sector so power includes transmission distribution and generation and energy sector includes various uh, your uh, petroleum transportation like uh, iocl and others as well as uh, gale next critical sector is the transport sector which caters for air rail road and uh, water transport systems this health sector is the latest one which uh, we not which we declared as a critical sector after uh, covid incidents this includes various uh, government uh, hospitals and other agencies which are involved research agencies which are involved for health sector strategic and purpose sector enterprises this basically strategic units for example isro and other agencies which are part of this psu so we interact with those agencies for ci identification and last one is the government agency which are involved with uh, governance of the country so various government agencies and other public and private sector entities which are even not part of other discussed sectors this falls under the government sector so these are the total seven critical sectors right now ncipc interacting for protection of their cis ncipc is having zonal offices at four locations we as a headquarter and north zone office located at uh, headquarter delhi and we cater for a northern sector of country other zonal offices are located at mumbai that is basically looking after the west zone which includes maharashtra gujarat rajasthan goa dadar and daman etc south zone office is located at bengaluru which uh, looks after a southern part of country and last one is zone office located at kolkata which look after east zone and north east zone so total four places we are having an ncipc office and officers are posted there with supporting staff in case of some contingency the nearest office are there to provide the immediate support followed by the uh, other support is required we are here and will further extend the support the various protection related activities being performed by nciipc our job starts with the identification of cii to various critical sector entities i will discuss in detail how we interact with various uh, critical sector entity and how we identify the cii we also issue various alerts and advisories based on various inputs we are also having a national security analytics center which i will again discuss later so based on that inputs and inputs getting from multiple agencies we issue alerts and advisories to various already declared protected system to those entities as well as potential ci entities which right now have not been notified as a protected system but still we feel that those are potential ci entities so we give our alerts and advisories to those entities we do conduct training and awareness session on cyber security to improve the cyber security posture other than alerts and advisories we also continuously monitor the threat el threat in uh, threat entities and based on that we disseminate the various uh, uh, various iocs we do this through two means one is through emails and other is through automatic threat alert dissemination platform for protected system we also conduct based on requirement the risk and cyber security gaps NCIPC is also having various MOEs and we do interact with IITs and other agencies for various research related activities and support related activities we also provide the best practices guidelines and various SOPs that are available at NCIPC website and if you are interested we can access www.ncipc.gov.in various SOPs and guidelines are available various NCIPC alerts and advisories are also available at ncipc websites uh, after notification we do conduct the review of uh, policies and uh, we go through the various audit reports and bpt reports of critical sector entity and we provide our and we provide our suggestions 
being part of ntro we also have various mois and uh, various uh, various cooperation with international agencies as well as national agencies and we get lot of inputs from those agencies and with them based on that we, we share the various alerts and advisories to critical sector entities so these are the various protection related activities from ncipc side we do issue the tailored alerts and advisories this is based on the once we have notified something as a protected system then we ask the concerned entities to provide the list of hardware and software inventories and based on that in case some uh, some uh, vulnerability has been reported to ncipc then in case that particular hardware or software is available to you then we provide the tailored alerts and advisories how to mitigate that we also provide near real time dissemination of threat intelligence based on our automated threat dissemination platform which we can based on uh, application we can directly ingest to your uh, simsoc solution we do conduct periodic risk assessment and cyber security review which i have already covered earlier as a part of ncipc we are having dedicated incidents response team and in few cases we are having team is specialized to particular sector for example telecom sector and bfsi sector so in case some uh, incidents has taken place based on the requirement ncipc provide the support to concerned agencies we do conduct workshop and uh, Uh, in past uh, about a uh, two week back we have conducted a workshop and table top exercises to various sector sector entities that includes uh, telecom sector also on 22nd we conducted that at bijan bhavan so these are the few supports which as a part of ncipc we provide to critical sector entities now the first thing which i discussed that ncipc job starts from the ci identification and as on date the ci identification has been completed for bsnl and mtnl for uh, various computer resources and as per gadget notification even international border gateway router and uh, <coughs> ems has been notified for all licensed telecom service providers however the procedure which we follow is that ncipc based on uh, interaction with ministry or regulator ncipc interacts with concerned organization which we feel that that might that organization might be a potential ci organization and then we request that entities to identify their critical business process because it is not feasible to identify each and every hardware or software application whether that is critical or not so we first request to go and identify the critical business process which is critical to function as a entity itself and then conduct the assessment of identical business process this is a joint identification process where ncipc interacts with that particular critical sector entity and jointly we see that whether that particular business process is actually critical and having in case of incapacitation of that business process whether it is having impact at national level or not and that impact is whether having impact at four pillar which i discussed at national security national economic public health and public safety and whatever experience i have for telecom sector entities in case your uh, 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 hardware software incapacitation is there certainly impact is very critical and most of cases that impact we felt as a national security is being jeopardized so certainly this is very, very critical for telecom sector so once we feel that uh, the magnitude is impacting any one of these four pillars then we ask to prepare the list of designated roles for the entities who are supposed to have in future access to those critical it resources and then one report is prepared by that uh, concerned critical sector entity where ncipc also provide the support while formalizing the final report and based on that that final report with recommendation of ncipc is forwarded to concerned ministry for notification of protected system final responsibility for notification 
rest with the concerned ministry because ncipc is there to suggest final decision whether to notify as a protected system rest with the concerned ministry and concerned government agency few cases the notification is being done by concerned ministry and a few cases the same is being done by mip so this is the detailed say identification process i am aware that uh, we are running a short of time so about next 5 minute i will complete NCIPC is having a national security analytics center where we are getting inputs from protected system. Once some entity has been notified as a protected system, then as per IT rule 2018, that entity is supposed to share their perimeter logs with NCIPC. So we get a lot of uh, logs from that critical sector entity. And NSAC, we are having a solution in similar to SOC and SIME. We also get a lot of threat indicators from various source, various agencies, whether it is paid or uh, free or from various uh, international and national cooperations. We also get various inputs. And based on that analysis from NSEC, we generate the reports and we share that particular report to concerned critical sector entity. And then we request to share the action taken report to NCIIP. So this is the, once your system had been notified as a protected system, this is the support which we are providing that you are sharing your logs to NCIPC and NCIPC do conduct some analysis and we share the reports almost in near real time. Automatic threat decimation patrol, whatever NCIPC has with API request, in case you are having a SOC or SIM solution, we can ingest that directly. So NCIPC, based on request, NCIPC will share the API and you have to provide a white listed IP that will be configured at NCIPC, NCIPC and then you can directly ingest the threat uh, dismissal platform of NCIPC. In case you don't have this feature, then NCIPC also providing the alerts and advisories through email. The baseline compliance for CI entities, once you have declared notified as a protected system that you are supposed to form the information steering committee, composition as flashed, and role and responsibility of IISCs is to approve the all information security policies, approval of significant changes of network configuration applications. And then you are supposed to discuss all your major cyber security incidents which happened in past with ISSC, review the various audits reports and compliances, advice on their cyber security related matters. So this is the one support because NCIPC is part of IISSC. So we do actively participate as a member of ISSC and provide supports in these things. Then we also provide the valuable input to your ISMS and CCMP documents. Plan, develop and maintain the review of following documents which I have already flashed. These documents are being maintained by critical sector entity. Then we provide our input to that, those policies. NCIPC also provides supports for BTR analysis and other things which already critical sector entity has conducted. So we provide our inputs on that. Conduct internal and external information security audits. In this case, NCIPC does not uh, conduct full-fledged security audits. However, as per requirement and request, we do conduct the focus audits for any specific cyber incident. The concerned uh, protected sector entities are supposed to share their logs with NCIPC and based on that analysis of log, we do generate threat intelligence on real-time basis and we provide that uh, report to concerned entity and also support during the analysis and action taken report. For a protected system, the concerned entity is supposed to nominate a CISO who is supposed to be the center point, uh, one point contact for NCIPC and then he is supposed to implement the all measures which NCIPC provides. In case of any cyber incident that concerned entity is supposed to intimate to NCIPC and follow the SOPs of incident response which NCIPC has uh, 
uploaded on our website so anyone want that he can access that so these are the supports being provided by ncipc i have just finished in case of any query i am open to all of you any query i think uh, there is no query so uh, uh, thanks for your uh, very informative and nice presentation and i request to vishal dheer for give a, a vote of thanks to singh sir thanks a lot sir uh, i am vishal dheer director of pr and nti priority and on behalf of nti priority i wholeheartedly thank you for taking out time for this session and sharing your insights on role of ncipc uh, in telecom security in infrastructure in our country uh, we know the kind of role ncipc is playing and how the critical sectors are one level and how uh, the things are being implemented to take care of the security aspects uh, in this scenario we are highly thankful and uh, hopefully see you in other webinars also sir thanks a lot sir thank you Thank you, Vishal. So, uh, next session is about uh, uh, mandatory testing and certification of telecommunication equipment, that is MTCT. So, this session will be delivered by Mr. Uh, Dhanesh Goyal. He is the uh, so. Just I will introduce to uh, Dhanesh Goyal. Uh, Mr. Dhanesh Goyal is currently working as Assistant Director General in Telecom uh, Certification Division of uh, TEC and is the part of the team responsible for implementation. Uh, implementation of mandatory testing and certification of the, of telecom equipment for the uh, uh, for the uh, uh, past four years. Uh, he has done BTEC uh, uh, from uh, NIT Kurukshetra and MTech from IIT Delhi. Prior to joining ITS Cadre, he has worked with uh, MS Ericsson and Samsung and has industrial experience of uh, five years. With this, now I hand over to uh, Mr. Daniel Gyal. Over to you. Mr. Dhanesh. Thanks a lot, Yashwan sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, please. Is the screen visible? Yeah, the screen is also visible. Okay, uh, so I'll start. So as sir told, uh, I will talk about the mandatory testing and certification scheme. So today's session was about the telecom security uh, framework in the country and we talked about the uh, threats being analyzed and uh, advisories being issued by various organizations including ESOP and we, uh, uh, and NSC, IPC. So, but uh, what MPCT does, it's product testing. And uh, so product testing under MPCT, it's mandatory. So the MPCT came into effect on 1st October of 2018 uh, through a gazette notification, which is in, in which a part 11 was added in Indian Telegraph Amendment Rules, dated 5th September 2017. As per the Gazette notification, it was notified that all the telecom equipments uh, shall undergo testing and certification against the ERs. ER is the technical document or regulation or the standards which are being released product specific and prior to sale import and use in India. And ERs are formulated through a consult, uh, consultative process which includes the equipment manufacturers, labs uh, and the regulatory bodies. So the basic five objectives of uh, mandatory testing and certifications was that any telecom equipment shall not degrade the performance of the existing network to which it is connected. So how it is ensured? It is ensured by testing the technical conformance of the product with various international and national standards of IPU, uh, 3GPP and uh, many FCC standards. Then the second main objective was the security of telecom network. Third was the safety of end users. This safety accounts for the IT safety, IT general safety, which uh, prevents uh, users from electrical shocks and the tolerance levels of the equipment, uh, the components from this equipment is made. Then uh, protection of the users from the radio frequency emissions, because we know that every product, when uh, it, its uh, current is being conducted through the product, uh, some sort of uh, interference or electromagnetic interference is emitted and uh, it's conducted through it. Uh, to, to prevent that, uh, one of the objectives of that, and one was the compliance with the relevant technical regulations. So, main salient features of this scheme was uh, is that uh, certification is done for a primary model and its associated models. 
associated models are basically a subset of the primary model which is the highest model then uh, mpct prior exemption from testing is allowed for any product which is being brought in for r and d uh, demonstration or as a sample for mandatory testing then we as the tec issue this mpct certificate uh, with the validity of 10 years initially it was 5 years and it was announced last year in july and the test reports that are being uh, accepted under mpct are uh, from tec designated labs Uh, these are the in country labs which are designated by tec through a uh, designation procedure and in some cases we also accept ilac uh, reports ilac is a uh, international lab accreditation council which uh, accredits uh, uh, lab across the globe we accept ilac reports also but from uh, border other than border sharing nations then we have basically two schemes under our uh, mpct uh, one is the simplified certification scheme in which the test reports are submitted by the applicant but are not evaluated by tec then uh, there is a one general certification scheme in which the test report evaluation is done so this scs and gcs is not the scheme is not a choice for the applicant but it is fixed with the product so some products are scs under mpct and uh, some products are gcs second we talked about the essential requirements against which the product is tested so essential requirements basically consists of a five set of parameters a uh, first set is the safety standard it safety then the emi mc standard in which conducted emissions radiated emissions surge immunity uh, many parameters like these are tested then a technical requirements which can be the uh, ip conformance and uh, your uh, optical interface testing then other requirements which can be sar for uh, handheld devices like mobile and smartwatch and ipv6 uh, which is the ip conformance and then fifth and the most important parameter is the security requirements uh, for which uh, standards separate standards are being made by nccs bangalore Uh, which standards are called as ICSAs, Indian Telecom Security Assurance Requirements. These are prescribed by the NCCS Bangalore. And currently, MPCT portal uh, is only limited to for testing of ER, which consists of the first four set of parameters. Security parameters are not yet notified. We have notified the security testing of two products, IP router and Wi-Fi CPE, with effect from 1st of July 2023. and by then only the portal will be integrated with uh, mpct and nccs platform then this is the fee structure under mpct in which the products are uh, broadly classified into four product categories uh, a b c and d accordingly the portal handling fee which we can call as administrative fees charge then the er evaluation fee and its are evaluation fee So its are evaluation fee will be applicable only for two products and with effect from 1st July of 2023 that is Wi-Fi CP and IP router. Then let's talk about the implementation of MPCT scheme. Uh, so this uh, MPCT scheme we have implemented in phase manner and we have uh, notified four phases as of now and we have started first phase in 2019 which comprises comprised of a basic telephony products then second phase which uh, in which we notified six product variants under three ers then in phase 3 and phase 4 major chunk of products were launched which consisted of a uh, networking product optical fibers uh, then your uh, transmission products uh, radio products bts base stations many things uh, as of now we have issued around uh, 647 mpct certificates or uh, across all the product categories and 75 modifications uh, registered oems on portal are 105 in indian oem category and in uh, in foreign oem it is 153 so phase one products as i said were basically uh, telephony products like two wire telephone handset which is a pstn phone then a z3 fax machine uh, modem this is a v92 modem which is also cable modem then uh, isdn uh, products cordless phone and uh, PABX. In phase two, uh, we notified a PON product which consisted of PON, ONT, and OLT, which are the major products. Then phase three, we notified eight products: uh, base station, 
and Wi-Fi equipments, which are the equipment operating in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, tracking devices, IoT gateways, and uh, we are accepting ILAP reports till 30th June 2023 for 24 products of phase three and four. These are the notified products of phase four. We can see major change is the transmission products, optical products, satellite products, uh, HF and VHF radios, routers and lane switches, um, uh, conferencing project products, then four telecom equipments like DSC, RNC, uh, uh, signaling gateways, GPRS. Now, uh, the ITSARs that we have notified are two ITSARs, uh, IP router and Wi-Fi CPE. So basically what sort of parameters are tested under these ITSARs which will ensure security. So these are the uh, some set of parameters like parameters related to the access and authorization under which role based access control can be tested. Then uh, authentication, which means a strong password, inactive session timeout. Uh, then software security in which secure update and uh, secure uh, uh, software updates, uh, upgrades will be checked. Then the data protection is done, the cryptography which is used, the keys which are used, which will be checked. Then a uh, vulnerability and port scanning, which can be done through the uh, vulnerability scanners like NASA scans. This can be done, uh, which will find out the vulnerabilities of the uh, open interfaces and the open ports that can be uh, solved before uh, launching the commercially, commercially the product. Then the first testing in which every protocol is tested and uh, uh, basically it's sort of attack is done on the product. Um, uh, information, misinformation is fed in the product and it is seen how the product behaves. Then the web security is checked like uh, use of HTTPS, TLS 1.2, the latest versions are being uh, done or not, uh, SNMP version 3 and remote for code execution prevention is being uh, enabled or not. Then network services are checked like uh, traffic filtering, anti-spoofing. Then uh, DDoS prevention is checked like ping may not be enabled, if otherwise a DDoS attack can be done. <clears throat> then other security parameters like remote diagnostics, unused port disabling, etc. Now uh, the labs which have been designated by MT, uh, TEC for testing of uh, ERs, we have total designated 62 labs out of which government are 16 and private are 46. Designated labs for EMI, EMC testing are 32 and for IT safety it is 43. So we can say ample labs are available for testing of EMI, EMC safety. For technical testing, we have uh, uh, some uh, labs uh, like uh, two, three labs. We have for Wi-Fi, we have five labs. For IP security, we have three labs. For IP uh, conformance, we have three labs. This is the designated security lab. One lab has been designated by NCCS for testing of Wi-Fi CP and router for the ITSA. So uh, the lab is based out in Mumbai. So uh, let us see about some uh, um, uh, certification steps and uh, the MTCT portal. So the steps for MTCT certification are uh, basic profile registration. The process starts with the profile registration in which any Indian OEM or foreign OEM can register on portal uh, by submitting the name of the OEM address and uh, the documents, registration document, like article of association, memorandum of associations, then the profile submitted by applicant comes to PC for approval and we check the documents and uh, approve the profile. After which the applicant will submit a product and the product it will uh, select the type of variant and then submit the bill of material of the product. Then this bill of material is checked by uh, DC and it is accepted by DC. After which payment is done by the applicant and at this point of time the application is registered. After the registration of the uh, product uh, application, the applicant can upload the test reports, uh, which has been tested by the either the designated caps or ILAC, wherever it is applicable. And the submitted test reports are evaluated uh, by uh, our regional uh, telecom engineering centers. And this evaluation is only done for the GCS case. For HCS case, uh, directly the uh, test reports which are uploaded by applicant are uh, sent to the validation step. And after the validation, the certificate is issued, which is uploaded on custom portal also and is provided on applicant dashboard also for download. 
so mpct portal is uh, mpct.tc.gov.in and it is hosted on nic cloud so uh, it's portal for uh, complete uh, administration and management of certification under mpct cdot is our developer who has developed the portal so the basic portal features are the online registration of applicant product registration uh, bill of material evaluation evaluation and validation of test reports and issue of certificate some features specific to applicant are that registration can be done and applicant can uh, track its application through dashboard then uh, test reports can be uploaded online certificate generation is online uh, modification and renewal can be done online there is help desk also on applicant dashboard which he can uh, register query with the portal then profile details can be uploaded and during the evaluation if any query comes up from tc there is a mechanism of two way dialogue with the evaluators and validators and some internal roles for the internal stakeholders which the portal provides are uh, evaluator reallocation in case of a sudden leave then artec uh, reallocation for load balancing online help desk for cabs and for users lab facilities approval a creation of any new roles like evaluators bomb checkers testing officers or new cabs web managers and management reports and this is the process of applicant account creation uh, which we have uh, a little bit discussed like applicant will choose its indian oem and foreign oem for indian oem he will submit the approval letter and the uh, registration letter issued to by roc to the company and after will it, it can upload the uh, article of association member of association uh, in case the trusted source certificate is not available with the applicant then is the process of test certification we have also uh, a little bit discussed that but uh, for, for uh, if he will select the product variants submit the model number then uh, he will also mention about the software version in case of security testing the software is tested so the software version uh, overall software version of the product will be mentioned by the applicant and uh, software versions of the internal components of the product like active programming components will also be captured in the itsar bomb so whenever the itsar testing will be enabled there will be two bombs that will be uh, uploaded by applicant er bomb and itsar bomb and both will be uh, checked itsar bomb will be checked by the security evaluation team then uh, certificate modification and renewal uh, we have three types of modification which are permitted administrative modification uh, technical and uh, product modification product modification can be like hardware and software version change manufacturing location addition interface addition uh, addition of uh, sub units and chassis then there is uh, er to er plus itsar conversion because uh, post july two products have been notified so the certificate er certificates that have been issued to those two products will have to be converted to er plus itsar certificate so this option will be provided uh, by end of june on the portal and then renewal also can be done in which admin fee is charged and no change in uh, er and portal product thanks uh, let us see a portal uh, login also and uh, it's are also so this is the mpct portal uh mpct.tc.gov.in so this is the home page in which we have many sections like certified this is the list of certified equipments which anybody can refer and see what model numbers and to which oem a certificate has been given this uh, has all the list of uh, uh, equipment all the 728 entries <coughs> then list of designated labs is also available then uh, essential requirements a list of er we have notified around 52 to 53 er in phase 1 2 and 3 4 all the er are available here then list of itsars are also uploaded uh, and any uh, uh, documents related to instructions with respect to mpct procedure or any circulars are being uploaded in the download category uh, with dated and uh, title of the notification so uh, this is the mpct portal and this is the uh, applicant point of uh, starting point from which he will apply for certification so i will log in into one account
so this is the applicant dashboard uh, which is visible to the applicant on its uh, portal in which he can uh, generate any uh, this is the profile section in which uh, the profile details are being shown and uh, these are the submitted profile that he can also edit profile and he can submit a fresh application in which uh, he can submit a mpcd application so he will choose a product and a product variant suppose i choose a uh, router then uh, the variant which i choose accordingly post july uh, 2023 itsar will also be shown here that itsar certification is also applicable and itsar parameters will also be shown you can uh, upload the bomb file here uh, the uh, bill of material file which uh, encompasses the uh, product description and a modular level then interfaces can be selected by applicant and he will submit the manufacturing locations also of the product where it is being manufactured and in contact details of the person at the manufacturing site so this, in this way he will submit a application to us and this is the software version where he will mention the software version and once the uh, process is completed and a certificate is issued this uh, the certificate issued certificate will come in this section and by selecting a certificate he can proceed for modification and renewal and from a modification he can sum, convert that er certificate to er plus xr also and this is the help desk section online help desk section where he can uh, raise a query for any type of category like interface related or profile related now now uh, let us see about the nccs portal uh, this is the nccs portal nccs.gov.in Uh, in which they have uploaded all the list of xrs and the pscls which are being de designated so only two of the xrs have been notified as of now but the uh, no, uh, xrs that have been uh, made are all the xrs so under mpcd only two xrs have been notified wifi ct and ipi router so uh, this is the list of uh, tscls uh, which uh, is being uh, designated which has been designated by nccs Uh, the list will increase, and it is expected that by end of July, uh, by end of June, two three labs will come for security testing of IP router and Wi-Fi CT. So uh, I close my session now. Uh, thanks.